Okay, we're gonna switch gears here a little bit and our, 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 our final three presentations will focus on uh, lamprey, uh, which are several species of important and often underlooked fishes. Although we did learn earlier that they can be an important food source for uh, Alaska's invasive pike populations. Um, but for the most part, uh, Alaska salmon streams are also lamprey streams and many of the same conservation issues that relate to salmon um, also relate to lamprey. Um, the first of these presentations is from Christina Wang from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Columbia River Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office. Hey, Christina, uh, go Hi. ahead and take it away. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, as Dan said, I'm with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Vancouver, Washington, um, and I'm really happy to be here today. Let me start and share my screen here. Oops, just a second. Okay, how was that? Everybody can see that okay? Yeah, yep, I can see it. Okay, great. Um, so on behalf of the Lamprey uh, contingent here today, we wanna thank you uh, for allowing us to crash the party, so to speak. Um, and talk to you about making connections with lampreys. Um, I'm gonna give a general overview about the importance of lampreys and the connection to salmon. And then Trent Sutton is gonna speak next uh, more specifically about lamprey work occurring in Alaska. And then Alicia Mars uh, is gonna bring it home with the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative and how you can get involved. So you may be asking, are salmon and lampreys actually connected, and quite literally, yes, they are connected. Um, many lamprey species are parasitic, and salmon are some of their favorite hosts. So lampreys get nourishment um, from them, they hitch rides, and who knows, maybe some of them um, get some good conversation along the way from, from salmon. So lampreys are very primitive relative to other fish. Uh, they have no scales, they have a cartilaginous skeleton, so no bones, no paired fins. Um, they have the sucker mouth, which you can see here, which is very useful for them for all sorts of purposes, um, it, and not only just eating. Uh, they have rows of teeth and they have a rasping tongue, and they use all of these structures to physically connect with their hosts to get nourishment and to hitch rides and um, to do all those things that parasitic fish do. There are about 40 species of lampreys worldwide. Some of them are parasitic, some of them are non-parasitic, some are anadromous, and some are resident. And this is a picture of a Pacific lamprey. So there are five species of lampreys occurring in Alaska. Um, some of the anadromous and parasitic ones are the Pacific lamprey, uh, the Western River lamprey, and also the Arctic lamprey. And then there are resident species of lampreys in Alaska as well, the Western Brook lamprey and the Alaskan Brook lamprey. And I imagine that Trent is gonna to talk to you in more detail about the distribution of these species and some of their, their differences. But it's great, we actually have a really wide variety um, of species of lamprey um, on the West, uh, in this part of the world. Um, so we're, we're pretty lucky to have all of these native lamprey species. So lampreys are an integral and founding part of the ecosystem. Um, they have co-evolved with salmon. Um, if you take a look at this timeline when various creatures have appeared in evolutionary history, um, you might be surprised to see, so we've got humans on the right there. So we're just you know, evolutionary babies here, 100,000 or so years. Salmon about 6 million years ago. And then if you move um, to the left here into the age of the dinosaurs, which we think of as being a really long time ago, hundreds of millions of years. Um, and then you see sturgeon, which look really old. They seem really old um, at about 200 million years ago. And you keep going to the left and there you'll see lampreys appearing in the fossil record about 450 million years ago. So this picture, um, uh, the actual image there is a fossil record of a lamprey from 360 million years ago. Um, and you can see in that image that, or in the fossil image, that they look largely the same as what they do now. So 
clearly a very successful body shape, successful um, adaptation strategies that they've been using for hundreds of millions of years. Lampreys are considered a first food and a subsistence food for many Native American tribes. They're critically important to Native American families and to their culture. Um, Elmer Crow, uh, who's pictured here in the middle holding a, a lamprey, he was a Nez Perce tribal elder. And he said, the lamprey is our elder and without him, the circle of life is broken. So in the Columbia River Basin, in coastal Washington, coastal Oregon, um, California, there are tribes where lampreys are very, very important. And also in Alaska, um, there is uh, a native, people have um, important connection to lampreys. Um, and this is an image up here of uh, lamprey harvest of Arctic lamprey on the Yukon River. So they have a really interesting life cycle that's somewhat different than salmon. Of course, the anadromous lampreys uh, have similar aspects to it and they have similar types of habitats, but there are some very different things which really factor into how we can better think about um, and consider lampreys in our restoration work, um, in our uh, uh, fish passage fixes and, and so forth. So I'm just gonna describe to you very um, briefly about some of these differences in their life cycle. So when we start with spawning adults on the right there, they spawn in, in fresh water in, in a habitat similar to what a steelhead would spawn in. Um, they lay about three, up to 300,000 eggs. So they're incredibly fecund. Um, those eggs hatch in about three weeks. And then they, this is the, the very different part to other fish. They transform into a larval stage um, and they're called larval lamprey or they're called amacetes. And this larval stage will burrow actually up to 10 years. Um, the, the, the current literature says three to seven years um, and it's been that way for a while, but new genetic information and some um, parentage analysis that's been going on with translocation programs the tribes are doing have um, shown that they are potentially burrowing for up to 10 years, which is quite remarkable. They transform into the juvenile stage um, where they grow eyes, they grow this mouth with teeth, um, their di digestive system um, connects, they, they were filter feeder, feeding as larvae. So they, uh, when they transform into juveniles, they're preparing now to be parasitic. And those parasitic juveniles migrate to the ocean um, where they are for uh, up to five years. Um, so this, you're understanding how long lived the, um, these lamprey species can be. Uh, and so then they're parasitic in the ocean. They have multiple hosts in the ocean and then they return to freshwater um, and Pacific lamprey don't return to their natal streams, um, which is something that's very different from salmon and which we think of as having very distinct populations. So um, they're returning to a place with suitable habitat. Um, and that suitable habitat includes uh, this figure on the bottom type one habitat, which is this very silty smooth um, sediment that they can easily burrow in. Um, type two is getting more into a combination of this silty sediment um, with some cobble and then into type three, which is that spawning uh, cobble habitat. And then you see along the banks, you know, the, the adults when they come in from the ocean, um, before they spawn, they actually overwinter for about a year. And so they're looking for areas where they can overwinter kind of hunker down and oftentimes they do that along the banks and under large rocks and boulders. So um, there's a lot of different habitat needs uh, with lamprey species and something that should be considered in restoration practices. So ecologically, they're critically important. And we think of salmon as being ecologically important as well. Um, but the relationship with lampreys and salmon is, is really important and with lampreys and other organisms in the ecosystem. So salmon, trout, birds, mammals, crustaceans, humans, everybody eats them. They're really high in lipid content. Um, they have a much higher calorie count than salmon. So they're actually considered a predation buffer for salmon. And in the larval phase, they are an in-stream native alternative to earthworms um, from the, the presentation from Matt earlier today. Um, they're actually called earthworms of the underwater. They kind of look like earthworms in the larval phase. Um, and they're very, very tasty. Um, Pacific lamprey have 46 known predators, at least and 32 known prey species. So beyond the food web, they contribute ecosystem services that are critical to their communities and directly impact salmon. 
So thinking back to their life cycle and their behaviors that I described and the habitats that they're using through nest construction, burrowing, filter feeding, spawning, they're changing habitats. Um, so let's dive into exactly how they're doing this. So sea lamprey, in a study by Daniel Weaver et al. at the University of Maine, um, found that sea lamprey spawning nests support a greater, greater macroinvertebrate abundance and potentially change changes in macroinvertebrate assemblages from the physical and chemical changes to streams brought on by spawning populations of sea lamprey. And there's often very large conglomerations of lamprey reds um, contributing those ecosystem services to large geographic areas. Lamprey eggs, embryos, and prolarvae are rich food for other aquatic species, including benthic invertebrates, drift feeding fishes, and even certain amphibians. As I mentioned, larval lamprey burrow in the sediment for up to 10 years. Um, filter feeders, including lampreys, likely alter their habitat conditions. Um, the feeding and burrowing behavior of two species of Lephenteron lamprey, uh, lampreys native to northern Japan actually increased oxygen levels, maintained softness of the, of the river bottom, and increased abundance of fine particulate organic matter in and on the stream bed. So again, these are very important changes that these lamprey species are contributing to the ecosystem. And like salmon, adult lampreys die after spawning. So they're of course delivering much needed marine derived and other nutrients to the stream. So this is a photo of Pacific lamprey scaling Willamette Falls. Um, the Willamette River is a tributary to the Columbia River um, and Willamette Falls is just a little bit south of Portland, Oregon. So this is still a harvest location for tribes in the Pacific Northwest and one of the only sites that still have enough lampreys um, to harvest each year. So lampreys have threats everywhere they occupy, passage impediments, habitat degradation, uh, urbanization, poor water quality, predation, climate change, um, lack of awareness. So I know in Alaska, you are blessed with a lot of great conditions and maybe don't have as many um, of these threats as we do in different areas. Um, but as we were just learning in cold presentation before mine, um, you know, undersized culverts, perched culverts, all of those are very, very difficult for salmon. And imagine that for lampreys who, who don't swim as well and don't jump um, like salmon do. So lack of awareness um, and the importance of lampreys and the misperception that native lampreys harm salmon and other important fishery resources, along with negative media coverage, have definitely harmed lamprey conservation efforts. Um, and it is a major focus for us. You often see pictures of, of salmon and trout with really um, terrible looking lamprey scars. And the media always seems to call them, you know, horrific vampire fish and blood sucking leeches. And, and it's, it's a really pretty tough PR issue for us. So together partners have worked on projects that help both lamprey and salmon passage modifications, uh, translocation programs, outreach programs. Um, like I said, due to their differing swimming abilities, um, their inability to jump into culverts, um, the use of their suction mouth to move along the bottom and varying habitat requirements, um, lampreys have very different passage and restoration needs than salmon. So we really recommend holistic restoration practices that are good for all species. And John McMillan gave a really great keynote uh, address this morning about the Elwha Dam removal and subsequent recolonization of fish. And I'm so happy that he mentioned lamprey in that presentation. Um, they moved into the Elwha um, and into the white salmon after Condit Dam was removed in Washington. And they very quickly and without translocation assistance recolonized those areas. Um, so I loved what he said about um, how people underestimate nature, and that's definitely true in those cases. And it has to be true with lampreys for them to be um, have lasted on the earth for 400 million years. Finally, this is my last slide. I just wanted to mention, um, end my presentation with a comment about climate change and the potential impacts to lampreys and to salmon. Uh, this is a figure from a review of global lamprey species and potential impacts of climate change on various pathways in the community. And um, like Becky discussed this morning in her talk, climate change will, and in many cases are already impacting the physiology, um, phenology and distributions of aquatic species. 
and the resulting changes in species interactions like lamprey and salmon, um, and finally changes in community structure and composition are likely. So with that, I'd like to thank you for listening um, and helping us raise awareness of how important lampreys are. Um, and we like to say that without lamprey, there would be no salmon, um, but we know at least without, uh, without lamprey, salmon would definitely miss them at least. So thank you to the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative um, and Alicia Mars, who's the coordinator of the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative Partnership, um, Trent Sutton and Sabrina Garcia, who lead the Alaska Regional Management Unit and all the participants um, in that RMU. So thank you very much. And thank you, Christina. Yeah, ho you're hopefully you're uh, helping us all uh, see see the cuteness of lamprey. Uh, <laughs> I we we that. try. <laughs>